What about Vietnam? A podcast with Gary Newsom. The series where Gary talks with travelers about their experiences and adventures. Find out more about Vietnam from the people who have actually been there. What about Vietnam? Whether it's adventure, exploring the culture and cuisine, shopping, or just soaking up the sun. Let Carrie and her travellers pave the way for a magical holiday in Vietnam. What about Vietnam? Xin chào and welcome to What About Vietnam? One of the main aims of the uh, podcast program that I put together for you is to try and choose subjects and get to you information that is going to make your experience of Vietnam so much more meaningful. I know myself, and I don't know about you, but when I'm traveling, there's just so much to take in, especially with a new country, with an exotic country, with a country that is very foreign to you. You can be uh, experiencing things but not really understanding uh, or get a full context uh, of, of that experience. So one of the things that I wanted to include in my program is a episode about noodles. Now, you may ask, Gosh, a whole episode just talking about Vietnamese noodles. Uh, yes, and it's really warranted because most of the tastiest dishes that you are going to try in Vietnam are going to include one or other type of Vietnamese noodle. You will see the noodles uh, in various places, in various markets, in various cities, and I've asked Neil Burmes to come on the show today because he's got a stack of knowledge about noodles and for lots of reasons why. Neil is the founder and board chairperson of Streets International. It is a social enterprise that offers programs for street kids, orphans and disadvantaged youth and they train them in the hospitality industry. Connected to the program is a restaurant that he coined Oodles of Noodles. So now you're with me now, now why he's on this program and why he knows a lot about noodles, which you're absolutely going to find out in this program. A bit more about Neil. Neil has received lots of honours and distinguished awards in the ensuing years of his career. In particular, or to just to name a, a few, he was awarded a membership to the Clinton Global Initiative in 2014. He was uh, also honoured uh, to be selected CNN's Hero of the Year in 2018. He's uh, a fun New Yorker uh, with a heap of experience and knowledge about uh, the making of noodles, there's some of the history, some of the different flavours you're going to experience. You're just going to have a ball with this episode because if you don't, then I'm doing something dreadfully wrong because I had a ball. Neil, welcome to the What About Vietnam podcast. How are you doing today? Thank you. I'm uh, delighted to be here. Look, um, I'm delighted to have you on the show because we're going to be talking about a favourite subject of mine, which is noodles. Now, I want to just preface this for my listeners in saying that, uh, and Neil and I talked about this before, that we've all grown up with noodles. Kids love noodles. We, we've had them in our lives for most of our lives and probably originating mostly from Italy. However, in the course of my going back and forth to Vietnam, uh, I have experienced uh, a totally new kind of noodle. And Neil, as as Neil has uh, set up an organisation called Streets International and is the founder, he actually developed this really cute program called Oodles of Noodles. And if you like to check his website out, they actually had tasting tours and training sessions around noodles in training people how to make them and then, you know, how to use them with various spots. So I'm going to dig into the trenches with Neil and I'm going to get him to explain to me some of the aspects of noodles that we don't know about, Vietnamese style. So... 
Neil, kicking things off, uh, tell us what the basis of Vietnamese noodles and why are they so different or so unique? As somebody who also uh, grew up on boxed, perfect size and shape noodles uh, <laughs> that that I think my mom probably stored for years at a time, right? Like uh, absolutely. Uh, the noodles of Vietnam are quite different, as as you well know, having been a frequent visitor and part-time resident, I guess we could say. So the noodles in Vietnam are a form that, in addition to rice, of course, the noodles in Vietnam, first of all, are not are wheat are not wheat based noodles like we're used to. They're all made so from rice. It's a rice growing country. So noodles here, first of all, are made from rice, makes them quite quite different. But they also form the fabric of so many of the great, great Vietnamese food and the great Vietnamese food that travelers love to experience here, whether it's street food or in the restaurants, noodles is really key to the fabric, we could say, of uh, Vietnamese food and come, as I hope we'll talk about, in many, many different related but many different forms and almost always fresh. Something we also in, in the West and most parts of the world we're not used to. Fresh meaning you use them in a few days or as we do in our restaurants, they go to the pig farm. We don't throw them out, but they go to the pig farmers and the pigs enjoy them. But they're only good for a few days because they're, they're legitimately fresh noodles. And that's true pretty much throughout the country. Yeah, and I think that was one of the most fascinating aspects of them when I first visually saw the noodles was in a market and 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 I want you to explain that a bit more but I know uh in 2019 I took my grandson and we went to a market in Hoi An and I said I want to show you uh is noodle making and noodles you know and a typical 16 year old he went oh gosh you know what what are you what are you going to tell me about noodles they come in a packet blah 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 I said well not exactly. Uh, this is a whole new spin. And you could just see his eyes roll when he saw these fresh noodles on, you know, in rattan baskets, etc. and, you know, a girl actually making them on the spot right in the middle of the markets alongside everything else. So talk to us a little bit about that making process and that and you know how how it all comes together and selling in the markets okay I'd be delighted by the way we we call those uh typically women um noodle ladies in the market okay and i didn't know that noodle ladies they're, they're, and that's with a lot of respect and reverence sure uh, um and 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 Hoi An, which is where where we're, we're based, and and has still, I think, some of the most uh, beautiful, uh, authentic markets in the in the country. Not because it's not such an urban area. Um, the noodle ladies are the ones that make and then sell a variety of different homemade noodles. And in Hoi An, in the center where we're particularly famous for a few noodles, which we'll we'll talk about, I'm sure. Um, some families specialize for generations in making a particular type of noodle. Oh, okay. For example, we'll, we'll talk about later, for example, Khao Lao, perhaps the most famous noodles special to uh, Hoi An in the central, central regions of Vietnam. Khao Lao is made by the same, fa- really the best Khao Lao. There, there are imitations for sure, but the really the best Khao Lao that most places serve are made by, I think it's a third generation of the same family in Hoi An. And the noodle ladies, back to our, our noodle ladies, they don't make Khao Lao. They buy it from the Khao Lao families, for, for example, because Khao Lao making is a, is, a, is a different type of noodle than all the other noodles. Now to talk about how noodles are Almost all of the noodles that we talk about and that we eat and we love in, in, in um, Vietnam, as I said, are made with a it's very simple. The noodles aren't simple to get right, but, but the, the recipe or the formula is pretty simple. It's ground rice and water. It's ground. Sounds water. simple. 
and water, mm -hmm. simple. Um, and then soak a, an overnight soaking process. Now, the, the, that is simple. And uh, as you mentioned, our, our um, kind of our, our, our cooking program that, we, that we're going to talk about later in, in Hoi An, we make some of this ourselves. The challenge is getting the proportions of water to rice correct when you mm -hmm. mix them. You're kind of making, you're, you're ending up with like a paste or a gruel, some people would call it. And some, some noodle makers say it's one to one. Some noodle makers say it's two to one. Some say it's one and a half to two. And uh, I've, lived, I've lived here in Vietnam over a decade. I have a Vietnamese family. So I, I, I probably know noodles as well as a foreigner could possibly ever, ever know them. <laughs> That's why. That's why you're here. <laughs> and and I, I think that the, the difference is that if you, you, could, you could eat the same noodle in different locations and it'll have a slightly different consistency. And also different rice um, comes apart when you grind it in different ways. And a quintessential... Vietnamese noodle maker will know that as soon as they look at the rice and that affects how much water this may be more than most people want to know but but anyway it's a simple formula and that's why the ratio uh, varies when you ask uh, or you try to make it yourself a little bit differently because because I think of the consistency in a particular uh, uh, rice so that so so that then you so then you've made this kind of we call it a paste. Some people call it a gruel. You could call it a batter. So now you've made that, and that's the same for many different kinds of noodles that are eaten all over Vietnam, many kinds of different dishes. Then you take that gruel or paste, uh, and you have one form or another of, your, of how you cook it. But it all comes down to the same way. In the old days, and still many families will do this, and the noodle ladies, some of them will do, the, do this, over a, a wood-burning fire, uh, there'll be a large cauldron, a large pot of boiling water. And over the top of that will be some sort of, um, we call it a skin, some form of a very light, uh, maybe a cotton or other material that hopefully has less chemicals rather than more chemicals in the paper or the skin. And that's tight over this boiling water underneath it. So a sense, in a sense, if you can picture it, it's a steamer. Yes. It's an open air steamer. Because that's the first step in cooking and making Vietnamese noodles is you steam them. Yes. So then on that skin, taking what we in the West would call a ladle, although in Vietnam we use, and I think many of our guests like to buy these and take them home. I'm sure you've seen them. It's a half a coconut shell cleaned out with a branch or some other brick from another tree put through it. And that forms your very, very authentic wood ladle that you put into the this now, this uh, uh, rice paste. Remember the rice, ground rice and water. And just like you make pancakes, you form typically some kind of circle, spilling that out gently onto the skin, depending on the size of skin, how many you can do one, one, one very large one. You could do two or three different sizes, etc. In our restaurant, we do it over a simple cooker, a pot cooker. And we use, uh, uh, we're very careful about the cotton we use. It, that's, it's an organic cotton with, with no, or with virtually, or as far as we know, no chemicals in it. That's stretched with a rim over this pot of boiling water. We do use the coconut ladles because I love them. <laughs> and I just, they, I, 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 they just, they look good. They feel good. And it, it just reminds us, I, I, I'm not sure where, where you are, where we are. And, and, and it's good to be here. <laughs> right. Exactly. And then, but, and then, then you, and then, so th then you just like a pancake, but of course, like pancakes, mm. you can also mess it up. <laughs> it, mm. If it's too thin, you start to get, it bubbles through. That's no good. If it's too thick, when you go to take it off, which is the next step, you can't get it off in a clean sheet. Hmm. And then you, you, you take it off again. We, there's a flat stick. You can use any tool, like you might a pancake uh, spatula. 
and you very slowly pick that up. Now you have to remember that that's thin and not easy to pick up. Pancakes, much easier. Pancakes, thicker. This is really skin thin. thin. And you then take that without it falling apart or what it wants to do is curl up on you, right? <laughs> it's just dying to curl up on you and you just don't want it to curl up. Mm. And, I, and I can tell you when we do this and we, you know, you know, we have many, many guests doing this. This is just everybody. It, it looks so simple. And then, I, and then, and then, of course, the people that work in our program, and a lot of them are, are teenagers, they're very good at doing this. And our, our guests, even we have chefs, start to pick up these skins without them falling apart. And, and there's a lot of laughter. <laughs> Absolutely. Lot of, and then, okay, so now you have that skin, and you're trying to get it to wherever you're going to do your cutting. Now, this is also one of the most important, fascinating parts of Vietnamese, Vietnamese noodles, because they still are largely hand cut. They're either just like I've said, they're hand cut, meaning they're, you lay them down on a, on a cutting platform and you cut them the way you want them. I'll talk in a minute about the different types of noodles. Or they go through um, what some of us who are lucky to have uh, uh, maybe grandmothers <laughs> had, a hand driven noodle cutting machine. And you take this uh, thin rice, let's say use the word pancake, and you put it through this machine, hand turning it. There's no machine, hand, a hand machine. There's no electricity, no battery. And then, no electricity. You, and then your noodles come out the other end. And Walk then they're out. all even kind and of. then they're yeah. kind of even, different, you know, even as hand cutting, not machine, not really, you know, fancy geared up, geared up machines. And there you have your noodles and you can eat those. And we, in our classes, we taste them and they taste really quite good. And, and that's your, your fresh noodle that forms the basis of almost all noodles in Vietnam. I have seen, as you say, many a person uh, think very positively that they can just grab that stick and just slide that under that thing and they're looking very, very confident and then all of a sudden it goes not where they wanted to because, as you say, it does curl up and, you know, everyone's watching them because <laughs> they're, they're going to do the demonstration on behalf of, you know, their family or group members or whatever and uh, it's been hilarious to see that where those, um, uh, what do you call them, noodle ladies? Yes. They are doing that all day and all. effortlessly, effortlessly. And never drop or mess a one up. No, <laughs> no, no. So, 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 that, so, yeah. that, so now you have. That's the, the basis. That's the basic. So that's pretty amazing in and of itself. No chemicals, no fat, very healthy, fresh noodles. That's, that's the basis. That's the basis. And then. Depending on what you what kind of noodle for what kind of dish, you can do you can do more. More things happen then. And I'll tell you about three or four of the if you three or yeah, four. Yeah, let's go. Okay, let's the, let's the, talk three or four of the main the ones. Most noodles that that um, our friends and travelers will experience Love. if they haven't already. Had. Okay. So the, the quintessential dish of Hoi An, uh, sorry, of Vietnam, Hoi An too, of course, most people know is pho. Yes, is pho, and this is a, this is just an amazingly delicious um, noodle-based soup. Takes many many hours to make really well. It's it's all fresh, and we eat it throughout the country, as you as you well know. We eat it on the street with with many excellent and clean street vendors. Of course, we don't eat it from the street vendors who aren't like that, and and almost. I think it's fair to say, if not all, majority of Vietnamese restaurants, regardless of their approach, have pho on the menu. Vietnamese eat it early in the morning for breakfast or before and for lunch and for dinner and for a late night snack. Pho can be made, basically there are two types, beef or chicken. Pho bo, which is beef, or pho ga, which is, which is chicken. And then, the, and, 
and they taste differently because the stock is made. But let's get back to the noodle is the same. Now the pho noodle, you can you can you do two different ways. You can take the noodle we just talked about, if you've cut them long and thin, and that's a pho noodle. More commonly, because pho is such a popular dish all over the country, so now you start to think about shipping and moving the noodle around the country without going bad. Because remember, these are fresh noodles and you, you can't, they're very perishable. And there's no preservatives. And yeah. there are no preservatives. That's exactly right. So the next step for most pho noodles and a few others is you bake them or dry them. And the way, and I, I say bake a little bit tongue in cheek, <laughs> so you bake them in the sun. Yes. And I, not and, in ovens. And yeah. Not in ovens. There, there are almost no ovens except commercial kitchens in, in Vietnam. And even then we try not to use it because it's so darn hot here all the time that who wants to make more heat? But, but those noodles and one of the, especially Hoi An, um, as, as you know, Carrie, for people that want to stroll and, and um, Hoi An, as you will know, is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and uh, the, cent the old the historic center is a walking area. You can walk, and very, very safe. Um, you can walk down these alleys still today, not right now during the pandemic, unfortunately, but soon we'll be back, I'm sure, stronger than ever. And you can see in front of families and noodle ladies' houses, reams and reams on what we would think of as screens uh, of pho and other, but let's stick with pho noodles stretched out, drying in the sun. Mm -hmm. And that's how they get baked. And so mm -hmm. that, that dries them. And there'll be tons of them. There's beautiful photographs. People love to take of noodles drying in the sun outside of uh, the yellow wash and orange wash local homes. And that preserves them. So now that noodle, once it's sun dried, is good for a long time. I don't know what the shelf life is, and they don't stamp it here, but but they're good for a very very long time. I mean, families keep them months and months at least. So that's your so, fun noodle. Then is sun dried. It's almost we could say crispy or the same. It's like the noodles we're used to coming out of a box. Yeah. I didn't know that that baking process actually was a form of preserving it. Yes. I didn't realise I didn't realise that because in some places uh, I've visited, they've had the noodles almost like on a clothesline. Dry. You know, they've been draped yes. uh, over the, over the uh, string line uh, and then some will be flat and they'll be just kind of lying out in the street. I didn't realize that the ba that baking process actually preserved them for a longer time. But it makes sense, as you say, if they're going to move the noodles around the country, uh, of which, like, there's just thousands of places and, you know, we're going to talk about some dishes uh, that uh, it, it is quintessential that they have the noodle because it is part, it's intrinsic to the dish. Uh, it, now it's kind of gelling in my brain of, now that's how they get it. Right. A fresh, uh, and and B, it's 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 not artificial. It's not not coming out of a box no, ever no. ever. That's right. It's not it's not coming out of a box ever ever. So okay. that okay. so that's the pho, one of the quintessential because that is the quintessential dish. Uh, it is, as you know, of Vietnam. Yes, and pho. I don't I don't care what you say. Like I live in Australia and I've travelled all over the world. If I go to a Vietnamese restaurant, uh, they are really hard pressed to deliver up to me the fur that I know in Vietnam. And I think, as you say, it's because of that uh, long cooking process of the broth. Yes. The magic is in the broth. And I think, as much as, you know, and I've had a go at it, and I know other people would probably do far better than me. But in Australia, um, yeah, it, it, it's very hard to get that because, you know, to to spend the time required right. yes. uh, and to find the freshness of the ingredients 
you know, without preservatives and, and you know, organic, all of that is is hard right. to do. Where in Vietnam, you the aromas that, that come from it steaming, you know, will draw people in. And as you say, it starts early in the morning. Yes. Uh, because they consider uh, a more savoury thing. You know, they don't necessarily have something sweet for breakfast. Um, they have something more savoury and fur is their optimum. Sometimes yes. you can go to try and get fur and it's only 9 or 10 o'clock and it's gone. They're sold out. <laughs> Yeah, right. yes. it's gone yes. because, yes. you know, everyone has come early and, and had first. So uh, I totally, totally agree with you. It's always my go-to yes. um, and I'll make sure I get as much of it into me as I can while I'm there uh, so I remember. So, yes, so, yes. So, so that's 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 far. And, and yes, uh, there aren't many people getting up uh, unless it's their, their career Many families getting up to start broth at 4.30 in the morning anymore in our a little bit more busy and hectic world. Exactly. Um, and that's what it takes. And, and I just, to, to, just to, to agree with you, and, and I, I, I think also is the herbs. I mean, when, when, when the herbs that, that we use, that family use, that we use in our places here, I mean, those herbs were, came from a farm within... Uh, a close distance by bicycle or motorbike uh, and probably were harvested that day or within two or three days before. Uh, I buy an herb in Melbourne or in New York where I'm from or London. That herb hasn't seen ground in weeks. <laughs> it, I mean, it's it, so it, true. Or maybe so longer. So homogenized. Yes. It, oh, no. Know, it, it, it's, it's probably seen the back of a truck for the last two weeks. And so we lose can a I, lot. Yes. Can I just interject with that? With that comes some shock systems for our tummies. Now, um, I think, you know, it's fair to say that um, – we are not, or the average Western person that would be visiting Vietnam would not be experiencing this level of freshness. And, you know, the soils are very different in Vietnam as well. So when when that um, when those herbs hit your tummy and and those uh, broths and, and things like that, sometimes you can have a reaction okay. and not a necessarily favorable one. But I try to warn people out about that because uh, I want people to have a good experience of the food and not automatically just uh, paint it as, oh, you know, there's something wrong or, you know, the food isn't fresh. That, that, that's most likely not the case. It's more the case that you are experiencing some different levels of um tastes and flavours and herbs and spices and all sorts of things that your tummy is just not used to. So sometimes a probiotic uh, is a very uh, good idea, and I've mentioned that in my trip planning episode back back when I first started this. Uh, so, you know, you can take that a couple of days before you arrive into Vietnam, and that kind of gets your tummy a little bit used to, to things. And, you know, you may have to take some... Um, some anti-diarrhea, et cetera, that kind of thing down the track. But it usually settles down in two or three days and, you know, then you can kind of march on and and, and really enjoy it. But I think I just wanted to interject with that at this and, point. And, and I'm, glad you, I'm glad you did. I think you, your, your experience and your advice is, is, is terrific and spot on. I think that um, uh, it's not a big, big worry in Vietnam as it might be in some of the surrounding Southeast Asian countries. Um, I've had food, food, food poisoning uh, all over the world, including one of the best restaurants in Paris and a pretty notable friends, but still notable restaurant in New York. I mean, you get food poisoning, we don't really know. It's just part of life from all kinds of things. But by and large in Vietnam, um, because things are so fresh and not preserved, that when they're bad, they show it quickly. Yeah, they show it and smell quickly, so it, it's not. Um, and I think also some of the things you, you said, it's just a. It's mostly not always, mostly a question of just getting used to it. And 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 what I what it just to add to that point for pho when pho is served, 
it's, it's, it, it's, as you know, it's a large bowl with this amazing broth and depending on whether it's chicken or beef, parts of, parts of that protein in it. And then it's topped with an assortment of herbs and often um, bean sprouts. Bean sprouts and, and lettuce. And- yes. But, but correctly, and almost everyone will do this, even the most local places, it's served on the side. And you decide how much you want to take or not take. And I think to, to, to what, what I encourage people, just like you said, Kerry, is start out with just a little, little bit the first day or two and let your stomach get used to this different kind of herb, different ground, different et cetera. Et cetera. And the bean sprouts, which are really yummy, if a little tip on that is uh, the more modern way is to serve them steamed. The older way was to serve them raw completely. Most places, and even I, and I'm pretty well adjusted here to, to the my stomach is anyway, um, you can ask any restaurant, including a local noodle stand, if they give you your bean sprouts uh, fresh and raw to please steam up. And, and, and even if you don't speak Vietnamese, you can show them and they'll understand quickly. And that's a good way to also assure that you don't get sick and you can still enjoy the local, local yeah. food. So that's fun. Let's move on then to probably the next most uh, popular and well-known uh, noodle called boon, spelled B-U-N, looks like fun. A noodle that in recent years, um, the former president of the United States, Obama, made very famous because he had a boon dish in, in, Hoi, in, in Hanoi. Hanoi. Okay. So boon is a, another noodle, but it has a little twist to it. And it's made with many, many different dishes. It starts out exactly the same as pho. Mm -hmm. Starts out exactly the same as pho, except there's an extra step in the boon noodle. In the boon noodle, after you, you, again, going back to the noodles, you have this rice and water paste that you make. It's sat overnight. The rice has to sit overnight. And then you can use the paste in the morning to make your noodles. The boon noodle has a second overnight when it's made really the artisanal local way, uh, a second night of soaking, if you will, after it's made, it soaks, you soak it in salt water. Because if you've ever noticed, boon noodle has a slight uh, smell to it. It's slightly, just slightly fermented. Oh, okay. Once in a while, a very, uh, a foreigner will pick up and it, at first they, they question, what's that smell? Because we're not used to it. It's a very, very light hint of a fermentation. And in fact, it is a light fermentation. So the boo noodle, what makes it and gives it a little bit, it's a little bit more um, sticky. And it does have a slight flavor to it of this fermentation from salt. That's all a little salt water, a second night of soaking. And then boon, as you know, is served typically uh, room temperature. You must serve also that boo noodle if it's not uh, if it's past its expiration date, which isn't stamped on it, but is about three or four days, it really starts to smell because the fermentation gets going. And so you'll you'll know that. If it's really, really strong, don't eat it. <laughs> but, and they bake that as well? No, no. Boone never can be baked. Boone always has to be a okay. fr- fresh noodle. Boone, oh, I'm the, loving this, Neil. Yeah. I didn't know this. Yes. This is great. Okay. And, and my favorite... And, and you'll see boon, it's spelled like and uh, like we would spell bun for, for people mm-hmm. when, when they get here. It's served in a many, many different ways, room temperature, big bowl of boon, with different types of things on top. My favorite is called, um, and if you're in Hoi An, you, this is one of the dishes not to miss, called uh, boon tit noon. And it, it, you're, you, you know this very well. It's just an amazing dish of basically what we would think of as uh, barbecued, pork. It's a particular cut of the pork that's marinated, very thin, and herbs served on this boon, boon tit num, num means barbecue, tit is a type of uh, pig or pork. It's very, very good. It's not fatty. Pork in Vietnam sometimes can be fatty. We use pork belly a lot, so it, it does have a fatty quality. But this is a very lean, uh, and really, if, if there's one boon dish uh, to try after you finish your first bowl of pho, is boon tit no. 
And it's really uh, good, right? You know this dish. I'm definitely sure. going in the list and on the uh, show notes for sure, Neil. Absolutely. Okay. It's got some spicy bits to it too, hasn't it? A bit yes. of crunch. Yes, mm. yes. It often, um, yes, and that's important to say, Carrie. Uh, important to say throughout Vietnam and particularly for Boon Tit Nung, it, it uh, traditionally will have uh, peanuts. So for people that are, are not uh, sensitive or have allergies, uh, Vietnam is a place to be careful of. Um, uh, I think people who have those allergies know how to be careful, but it certainly is indigenous to the food here, there's peanuts. They're grown here, they're sprinkled on a lot of things. and uh, But you can also have that on the side you can and, do, yeah. you know, Yes. 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 It's not, and, it's I, not, and I get a lot of people asking me about those things. Yeah. It's gluten it's, free and all that sort of thing. Yeah. And the nuts are used as a condiment in this case. They're, they're, so they're, exactly. on the, they're on the side. Okay. Exactly. So that's, that's, that's boom. Now, now, and those are throughout the country and they're a little bit different. I always encourage people that are that are taking, you know, some great journey north or south or south or north, have pho in Hanoi in the north, right, the capital, and have pho in the south in Saigon, Ho Chi Minh very City. Very different. Very different. Both delicious, but they're very different. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then boon have everywhere because it's made all kinds of different ways uh, and, and we don't have enough time for me to go through all the different ways. <laughs> but it's great. Yeah. Anyway. And part of the adventure, Neil. It That's is part what... of the adventure. And just yeah. if you get a little bit of smell, you know it's correct. It's the fermentation. Yes, that's, that's good. That's a great tip. There are two other noodles I, I, I want to talk about. There are two of the most famous noodles for people who have traveled Vietnam and people I think have really enjoyed Vietnam. And um, I'm, and and they come from Hoi An, where, which is where. We have our eateries where, where I lived for many years, um, and they're both amazing noodles. So let me let me talk about, and they both have stories to to them, particular stories. So the first one is called Mi Wan, two words, Mi and Wan, and uh, uh, what that means. I'll translate because I think it's interesting. Mi uh, in Vietnamese in Vietnamese means noodle, and Wan is Wanam province, which is the major province of the central region where Hoi An sits. So Mi Wan literally translates into noodle of the province. Oh, okay. Not many people know. Uh, no, I don't know. I that. didn't know that either. And Mi Wan is probably for my, me particularly, for myself, is uh, the most interesting, most delicious noodle that you can have. It's not the most famous. But it is the no, most I don't think I've tried it. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, okay. I, so Miwan, the way that I first learned about uh, Miwan is wandering the streets of, of early in the morning because Vietnam, certainly in the countryside, this well is as you know, at, comes to life at five thirty in the morning. Yeah. Now that was a pretty bitter pill for late, like late night New Yorker to swallow when I first started spending <laughs> time. But, but I, I've, I've adjusted. Yes. But, so, so Mi Wan, Vietnamese most typically will eat Viet, uh, like you said, they like something savory in the morning and they'll have Mi Wan, although you can have it all day. It's typically an early morning food. And I walk around and see this noodle dish that people are eating all over in the, in the streets of Hoi An and in Da Nang a bit. And I, and I, I didn't know what it was. It has different colors in it and it would just look, and I finally braved it. You know, I find I followed the same rule for many, many years traveling. Um, I'm sure I'm sure you have similar rules, like you just said. But um, hot food should be hot, cold food should be cold, and if a vendor's hands are dirty, go to the next vendor. Mm-hmm. And and I, I that's I, just common sense. I think isn't it? that yes, I think that is no matter how good the food may look. Mm. So I found the place, and I had this Mi Wan dish, and wow, I just it was amazing. It was. Again, a similar noodle to pho, but thicker and in many different uneven, very uneven cuts. And mm-hmm. it had, uh, uh, it's, not, it's not necessarily a dish for vegetarians, although we make it a vegetarian. It has shrimp and egg and pork all mixed into this and herbs. Again, I, 
I'm not a full-time vegetarian, but I, I appreciate it. But this is not a vegetarian dish at all. Into the noodle? Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. And as I've learned, and just yummy as could be. Just, just. Wait, uh, wait. Uh, no, nothing like bang zhao. No, this is miwa. And I just kept eating it, eating it. And I, and it wasn't, and it wasn't in any, you know, and it wasn't in any of the restaurants. It was just the street vendors, street, the street vendors. And I couldn't find it oh, in any, wow. any of the 15 or 20 years ago, none of the restaurants had it. And I started to ask around why, why about this dish and why didn't anybody have it in the restaurant? It was so delicious, not spicy at all, full of flavor. I learned that it takes easily four or five hours to cook again. The stock, the stock is made from all these ingredients, but then the ingredients are put back on top. So you have a fresh egg, typically quail eggs here, right? Small, really yummy eggs and fresh shrimp, not the shrimp necessarily that was used to make the stock and the sauce. It's, re it's really, really good. And so, oh gosh, it's going on my list. <laughs> well, in my mouth is even more important. So, <laughs> So I, I asked friends, Vietnamese friends that 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 uh, in restaurants, the owners and operators of, of good local restaurants, why didn't you serve this me one? This, this dish is freaking amazing. People will love this. Is you know we can get our hands around this. There's no snake in this. <laughs> you know this is. This we is, said we weren't going to talk about no, snake. Okay, well, okay, okay, okay. So sorry, sorry. Jump. Sorry. Let's jump. Take yeah. take that out. Okay. So here was the reason. Now this is. When I was first really poking around 15 or 20 years ago, things, as you know, changed a lot. And the reason was the following. It gets back to what we said in the very beginning of the noodles we're used to. These are really hand-cut noodles. Hand-cut means lovely but imperfect. Mm. So you you didn't go to a culinary school. You're trying to finish your noodles. So you cut them with a big, big noodle-cutting knife on this like flat, as we talked about before, this flat, round, typically laid out, maybe we could call it a pancake again. So it comes out, some pieces are thicker, some people, the width. Some are, some are wider, some are less wide, some are, some are capture the end of the arc in a different place, so the end of the noodle is different. And its response to me, which was a pretty damn good response is, are you kidding? You foreigners think all noodles come out of the box, and if they're not perfect, you shouldn't eat them. <laughs> and do you know that is there's some truth in that? And then, absolutely, there is Gosh. there is truth to that, especially. And I've learned a lot about that <laughs> through the years now. In when when foreigners, my friends, you know, I'm not, I'm not foreign to me, foreign to Vietnam, come into the restaurant about what gives them pause. Because they're being careful about eating, like like everybody should be. We talked about, and you see noodles that are kind of misshapen, and you're used to all your pasta coming out of a box. You say, "Whoa, yeah. did they, <laughs> what's going? <laughs> they did they cut cut the mold off of the end?" So, <laughs> so they I would, cut the mold off. I the end. I, I'm saying that maybe one would imagine an American or an Aussie first time seeing that. Anyway, okay, yep. I just got that the flavor was so yummy and it was such a great, we were, we were the first restaurant in uh, Hoi An to have Miwan on our menu in our first main uh, restaurant. And as you, and, and it was, it was, we tell the story of it, of course, as, as well. And as you know, we've opened a separate separate restaurant that all we serve is Miwan. It's it, noodles of noodles. Noodles yeah. of noodles, and we see ten thousands of guests every year because it's is such. And now all the restaurants have it. So that that's Miwan. But that, see, there's if I can just interject. See, there is the the gold in uh, education and knowledge. So you giving that background story you know, explaining fermentation and explaining, you know, not perfectly cut noodles haven't had the mould cut off. They were cut imperfectly but still perfect. Yes. I mean, that that is, they, they, there's gold in that. That is fantastic, Neil. I'm so glad you've shared that. I'm, I'm learning heaps here okay. and I've been thousands of times and I go, because I, I try lots of things uh, when I go, but I haven't had that in Hoi An. 
gosh. Well, you'll, you'll, we'll, we'll, we'll make it's on a, my list. We'll make a special ball, ball for you. Oh and, gosh. And and although it's a it's it's in its classic form, it's completely as I've said, the ingredients not a vegetarian dish at all. We also make uh, have figured out a way to make a vegetarian sauce using some fresh tomatoes and tofu. And I would say we make a very, I don't know if anyone else is doing it. Usually when they get wind, we're doing it. They figure out how to do it also. But we make a really yummy, in fact, I prefer it as I become more and more vegetarian myself. This is a good one to end on because it is the quintessential, most famous, any guidebook, any tour person uh, will talk about cow lao and that you must eat cow lao in Hoi An. It is a dish that uh, has been made famous and uh, made principally only in Hoi An. I don't. Yes, work... I can't get it anywhere else. No, yeah. and 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 uh, by the way, I, I don't work for the Chamber of Commerce. I just had an early love, <laughs> an early and ongoing love with Hoi An. Same, but, same. But um, cow lao, you should not eat in some restaurants. or try to serve it in in. in uh, Hanoi or sometime in Saigon, Ho Chi Minh City, but don't have it there. It, it, again, it's a fresh noodle and it's made only by two of the same families that made it by the same somewhat secretive and folkloric recipe for generations. And now if you've ever seen Khao Lao, it's a little bit brown color and it's a little bit of a thick, like some thick uh, Japanese noodles that we're, we're a little bit familiar with. It has the, the dimensions of that and even the consistency of that. But And it's and as I said, it's a little bit brown, right? A little bit brown color. Um, now, I'll tell you how cow lao noodle is made. Or what the, I don't know the, I don't know the secret, but I have a general sense of how cow lao is made. Again, it's made similarly to how all the other noodles are made. However, in the noodle, when the, the that again going back to that paste or that gruel right before we steam it, cow lao uses uh, you put some ash from a wood burning fire and a wood that has to come from Cham Island. For those of you that don't know, off the coast of Vietnam, or this, Cham Island, a Vietnamese island that you can go to and visit. A great fishing village island. Snorkeling. Mm-hmm. Snorkeling, yeah. Um, from certain trees, like an ash type tree, you make you you burn those to ash, and some of that ash goes into making the noodle. And if you think to make it a little bit more westernized, it's a it's a similar to adding a little bit of lye, a little bit of an acidic mm-hmm. to a recipe. And we're familiar with that. We 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 do use we think of lye as poisonous and for drains, but lye, a type of lye can be used, lime, for example, can be used in, in, in Western dishes as if you need a, a, some acidic component. And that's how cow lao is made. And then, uh, so you need some ash from a wood burning fire. Now, I've never seen those trees being brought in or the ash from Cham Island in, in 20 years. Never. But, but there is ash in it. Let's, let's say that. Maybe I'm just not there at the right time. The second part of the folklore is that the water that's used to make the cow lao noodle has to come from a particular well called the Bailey Well, which is down one of the streets in Hoi An, not far from our our restaurant. I have to tell you again, I know that well. There's definitely an old well there. There's no doubt about that. One, I'm not sure I'd want to eat anything that had anything to do with what was in that well, but... I've been around the streets of Hoi An, morning, noon, and night. I've never seen anybody take any water out of that well to do do it. Mm. But the folklore is, and it could happen when I'm not there, that that you must use the water from that. What I do know, though, is that there's really uh, only two uh, families that make cow lao, the really good cow lao, that they then sell to the noodle ladies that the noodle ladies say. And, that's uh, fascinating. And, and this is the most famous because it really just comes from Hoi An. Yes. So it's a no. little bit heavier noodle. And again, it's typically served again, the bowl of noodles. And on top of it will be uh, a slice uh, for Westerners, usually a loin of pork, a little bit of a grilled uh, uh, loin of pork, thinly sliced 
with what we would call a crouton, kind of a crispy crouton. It's very crispy. It's lovely. And, and some herbs and a sauce, a, a brown sauce that comes from making the pork poured all over it. And, and that's a really, delicious. That's delicious. That's really absolutely a, delicious. So I think we've talked about a lot of the great. Yeah. I, and, and Neil, I, I uh, I have truly learnt a lot today, and I'm sure my listeners have as well. I'm going to make sure that we uh, put uh, the names correctly in the episode notes and that. And of course, for everyone listening, I uh, when we finish the episode and it's uh, published and you can listen to it, we also produce a transcript from the episode. So if you wanted to, you can go to the website, whataboutvietnam.com, and you can print off the transcript. So you can highlight the dishes that Neil has mentioned and, you know, some of the particular elements of those dishes that um, may be helpful to yourself when you decide to eventually come to Vietnam and enjoy them. Because definitely uh, Vietnam is about the food. The food is distinctly fresh and it's well known for that and sometimes I just want to finish off on that freshness is that because uh, uh, in our urban lifestyles we don't actually get to physically see a lot of fresh anymore in particular things like uh, meat uh, and fish and things like that. You'll see them in um, our supermarkets and things like that. But as Neil said, they've probably been in a truck for two weeks before they got there. Yeah, yeah. Where if you see fresh meat and sometimes, you know, uh, that can appear in the markets uh, in the mornings, etc. when you go to look them and it, and it looks a bit, uh, for some people they find that confronting. Uh, you know, that meat is usually sold in a couple of hours and they might only do, you know, one or two kills a day. And so the restauranters get there early and get that meat and that is fresh. So that is the one of the big differences that I try to mention pe- to people when they're asking about food is that fresh or freshness that they talk about extends to things like that. But also now you're hearing from Neil uh, that it extends to to noodles, and you know we've learned a lot about the baking process to to preserve it. Neil, I just want to say thank you so much for your time today. Uh, it's been uh, a really entertaining episode. I've really loved it, and I think uh, for everyone, they've really learned a lot about noodles. And we hope to come and enjoy them at Streets International when the doors open. Great, thank you. Thank you for listening. Check out the episode notes for more information. What about Vietnam? Don't forget to subscribe, rate and review and stay tuned for more fun adventures in Vietnam. What about Vietnam?